going to talk a bit about the mix, but I, but you know, there's an awful lot on the agenda for the next few days. So I'm just going to pick in the brief time I've got a couple of other issues besides the mix. Actually, you know, there's a lot of discussion about policy in the UK. Most people in this room are here because they know an awful lot about those discussions about policy. They know an awful lot about the trilemma of how we balance the different competing themes of getting the cost right for consumers, getting the carbon down, and getting security of supply in the right place. <coughs> There's not one answer, which is one of the frustrations I often, often feel is people who stand up and argue this is the right answer. There's not one answer. There's a whole series of trade-offs and there's a whole series of scenarios, obviously, and I'm just going to touch on some of the pathways as we look at the mix in the UK out into the future. The job of National Grid, you're well familiar with. You know, we connect people to their energy. Uh, for people who don't work in the sector, it's still amazing that they think that it's just there and it's so easy. There is a developing understanding, fortunately, though, just about how much our modern society relies on electricity and heat and understanding that <coughs> it doesn't come easy and we've got a lot of change to make. Besides owning the big grid systems in the UK, we have a huge business in the United States that supplies 8 million customers and in the US, therefore, you know, we, we, we can see things very differently actually uh, and very differently because in the United States we bill people every month as well. Something I would not suggest that we ever move to in the UK, Tony, I can assure you that <coughs> the threat of the bill coming through the door every month just heightens the awareness and, of some of the issues that we're actually facing in terms of price. But we do think about our role in the UK because of the system operator, that we sit in many ways at the centre of the system uh, and under electricity market reform we have some new responsibilities that we take very seriously and acutely aware therefore of the opportunity we've got to try and provide a voice to all these competing <coughs> technologies, competing views about what the right answer is. So the right discussions are taking place. <coughs> we have always looked forward at supply demand and looked at scenarios. But in the last two years, that's changed substantially in terms of the amount of professionalism we've, that we've been putting into it in a world in which it's very unclear about what sources of generation are going to come on in the next 10 and 15 years. And in the autumn last year, we published for the first time, we published a document, put it out on the website, which was our views of the scenarios right out to 2050. Quite an ambitious thing to try and do. <coughs> and just to give you a flavour of that, we had three scenarios out to 2030, this chart is. Not forecasts, three scenarios. We named them slow progression, accelerated growth, and the middle case, gone green. I remember vividly the conversation around calling the middle case gone green, and I regret it enormously because of the implications of those words that are. Ah, you're now <coughs> absolutely advocating that climate change is the central point of energy policy in the UK. Uh, and it was just a reasonable when we put this together mid-case. Things of course have changed enormously since we issued these last autumn. But the slide highlights the huge amount of change that's anticipated. There's underlying growth in electricity demand, but you'll see not a huge amount. We've actually got three growth scenarios for demand. This is the one associated with gone green on this chart. And it looks at GDP, it looks at energy intensity in the UK, looks at manufacturing output in the UK, has assumptions around electric vehicle penetration, heat pumps and so on. And what you're seeing here is, despite all the efforts on energy efficiency, the advent of transportation and heat pumps begins to drive up demand over time. So it also shows though the huge increase in capacity, because so much of that capacity has a lower load factor than traditional capacity. So we end up with a, a very large installed capacity but you can also see on here that there's an awful lot of similarity. The big changes between the three scenarios are carbon capture and storage, offshore wind, and other renewables, which is always a pretty dangerous title, other renewables. There's marine in there, there's some biomass in there. And all except for possibly repowered plants for CCS, are new sources of generation that of course will need new connections 
and new transmission systems. But it's worth noting on that chart that the bottom stays pretty consistent. Gas has a huge role to play out into the future. Of course, coal is disappearing. And the margins to date, as Tony can explain on coal, have just been so attractive that, of course, you've seen the plants use up their hours far faster than we were assuming two years ago, far faster than the generators expected as, as well. Now, we, we've got to review these scenarios annually and publish in the autumn of each year our updated view. But what we did the first time out was, having consulted on these scenarios early, go out and talk to the market about their views of these scenarios. And we did that the back end of last year uh, and through the last few months. And the feedback, unsurprisingly, the general consensus was that the right-hand scenario, accelerated growth, was, frankly, pure imagination. Pure imagination. And you should remove it from your scenarios, National Grid. It just has no bedding in reality whatsoever. So my own expectation is that when we next actually publish this, we'll have two scenarios. <coughs> slow progression and gone green. Uh, and most of the people who, uh, who inputted into that consultation, when asked a series of questions about where do you believe the future is going to lie, interestingly put it somewhere between those two. Not quite as pessimistic as slow progression, but we're seeing our gone green scenario today as quite aggressive. And I think that's probably right. And behind here is an awful lot of assumptions, of course. But what is clear under any of these scenarios that you'll be picking up in these few days is the enormous amount of investment that's required, investment in infrastructure. And a lot of progress has been made, particularly on the policy front. It's frustrating at times that people continue to criticise the policy in, in the UK. Uh, I think we've made an enormous amount of progress in the last two years. EMR is groundbreaking legislation. Those that still stand on the sidelines and want to go back and start discussing the basics again are misguided and are not being particularly helpful to the industry or society in the UK. The Prime Minister and the government are right to think about we now need to get on with execution and delivery. The day for designing the policy is behind us. But I want to touch on some issues that I still am concerned about uh, and one of those is public acceptability, which, is, which for us is an enormous issue. It's no real surprise though, is it, when you're building infrastructure, particularly infrastructure like national grids, large pylons, large lines across the countryside, the world today is very different from the 1940s, 1950s, when we were building it the first time round. Most people in this room, because they're here, have an understanding in their mind about why this is important. <coughs> but we don't have that view broadly across the country. We've not actually articulated as an industry, nor as a government, the need case. What safe, secure, clean energy is really all about. So the construction of lines we're finding is, is not surprisingly, very difficult. And I'm not suggesting for a second that what we need to do is get out with some PowerPoint presentations and convince people, because that, that's not what we're trying to do not expecting anyone ever to volunteer to have a power station at the end of their street or a pylon in their back garden. You know, that's not where we're trying to get to. But we do need the public to understand this is important if they're to continue to enjoy the benefits of secure and cleaner energy into the future. And we've been doing a lot of work in, in this space and we started something last year called Powering Britain's Future, where we brought together a very interesting array of stakeholders from the industry, from government, from green lobby groups, from consumer groups to discuss how can we build a narrative around here so we can get the support of the public. Uh, and I sat through this six hour discussion and listened for six hours. But personally, it was quite an interesting experience. And it was tough actually. There's a really important signal as well about we actually need to listen. The industry needs to stop talking and presenting and sit back and listen to people's concerns and then enter into the dialogue. That was just the beginning. <coughs> We've had a series of sessions with all of these groups over the past six months, beginning to develop uh, uh, themes 
that we can jointly begin to talk about with consumer groups and local stakeholders around the UK. One of the issues that was identified very early on, of course, is that most of the communications that we and other businesses like us have engaged in the past have been totally one way. Totally one way. Let's come to a town hall near you this Friday and put some posters up and some presentations and explain to you why this project's really important. And trying to change that whole culture and approach so it's a listening, it's a two-way dialogue uh, is the way of the future, unquestionably. It's pretty clear that no single organisation is trusted either. The energy companies aren't trusted, as you know from all the polls. It's a fight to the bottom at the moment as to whether the government's trusted, the energy companies are trusted, or the banks are, are trusted. Each week, I think, on the league table, <coughs> we're switching around each other. And the green groups aren't trusted either. <coughs> so we're talking with a bunch of people who aren't trusted by society trying to have a dialogue. <coughs> but we have to have that dialogue and get that agenda shared amongst all of those groups. <coughs> We've got to talk about jobs. We don't do that. It's very interesting to contrast England and Wales with Scotland. Scotland's made a lot more progress in this space than we have, actually. <coughs> to Alex Salmon's credit, there is a dialogue in Scotland. There's a theme, there's a narrative around the energy sector, infrastructure, jobs and the economy. But it surpasses anything we have down south at the moment. <coughs> That's the opportunity for us in the future. There's a lot of work going on in government. There's a lot of conversations around infrastructure. You'll see more in the budget tomorrow, for sure. I'm sure James will pick it up. You know, there's enormous amount of rhetoric around it. But it's not understood. It's not understood by the public about the importance of it and the jobs and why we just need to get on with building things. And joining up those views in government is, is, is a, big a big challenge. We've got to get government and policymakers involved not taking on the discussion, but working with the industry. Neither of us can do it in isolation. I want to touch on planning. <coughs> I want to show you a simple chart, which is not that simple. This is the timeline of a project that we are building to tie in some generation in East Anglia into the wider network. <coughs> it goes from a substation in Suffolk to the T at Twinstead in Essex. It's a pretty small project, 27 kilometres in length. And you can see on this simplified version just the complexity of the process to get anything built. Now, it actually started under the old planning system. <coughs> but it's eight years so far from start to finish. Eight years. 30% of this will be undergrounded. So for the first time, we've run a new consultation with communities to understand <coughs> their desire to protect certain parts of landscape. And 30% is going underground through two special areas in Dedham Vale and the Stour Valley. That was two and a half years of consultation to, for us to come up with a recommendation that those were areas of particular beauty that consumers should pay, therefore, the premium for undergrounding. And when we announced that, guess what happened? Those communities were delighted and everybody else was furious. How come that's more beautiful? And it was quite, quite, quite understandable but incredible that we used a consultant's report that had, had identified in the Stour Valley in particular, which is where Gainsborough did an awful lot of painting, that that was an area that should be protected. And somebody down the road said, but my piece of land must be at least as beautiful as the Stour Valley. It was a real insight into the issues that we are going to have over the next 10 to 15 years. And 30% underground is a lot more than Ofgem have assumed in the price controls that National Grid have, where they assume that 10% of the transmission lines in the future will be underground. Beginning of this, and it will continue to run. I suspect we will continue to have issues here. So th these timelines are problematic. But the changes to the planning bill that were made under the Labour government and tweaked by the Conservative Coalition are, we believe, good for the future. So when I'm talking about planning, I'm not asking for any changes whatsoever. On the contrary, actually, the key is, please leave it alone. We now have a new system. We're stress testing it at the moment, for sure, and we'll find out. But it looks fit for purpose, actually. 
And the fear now is that someone's going to moan again about tweaking it and change it. And we need to allow the big industry, industries that are covered by the planning statements and the policy statements, to now start to build and test whether this will work. It should reduce a project like this by three years. But please, please don't play with it again. So we've got the bill. The bill ought to help deliver some of the infrastructure. We've got some of the regulation in place in the UK now. The finance is available. The planning system ought to be fit. So what do I worry about? I worry about skills. Enormously. The average age of our workforce in the UK is 44. Actually, the average age of people who do most of the physical work is 48. And in bits of our business, nearly half of the skilled workforce retires in the next nine years. Half of the workforce retires. And we're not unique. It's true across the whole of the sector. Uh, and, yep, we're all going to be working a bit longer as well, but we still have a huge issue. Uh, and the issue comes back to STEM skills in particular, appreciation of science, technology, engineering and maths, uh, and a lot of work I've done outside around how many kids we need to want to keep with those subjects, because even to come in as an apprentice into our organisation, you need GCSEs in STEM skills, uh, in STEM subjects. And 29% of all the jobs in the UK require that, and we're actually about halfway to that in terms of production at the moment. So we, I worry enormously about whether we've got enough skilled people in the UK to, to deliver the work. And if you look at some of the projects that we've built in the last few years, it is frightening to look at the labour that's coming, not just working for National Grid, but for our contractors, where we've imported labour from the EU for 75% of the skilled work. And that can't be right. And if I may, just for a second, make a plea, this gets to uh, a deeper issue for us in terms of engineers. I don't know whether you saw it on the news last, uh, last night, but the first award of the QE Prize for Engineering, uh, which is only the halo, only the, only the tip of, uh, of the iceberg to a certain extent, but hopefully we'll get a halo effect out into schools and kids and teachers that engineering is not just about dirty and greasy jobs, but really creative, inspiring, and they chose the founders of the World Wide Web and the Internet as the first recipients of an engineering prize, which I think was an inspired choice, but hopefully, well, ah, I now realise what engineering is all about. Because we need two and a half thousand engineers in the next six years. Two and a half thousand. And the competitiveness for those engineers in the UK is just going to be extraordinary. <coughs> and the one thing we need to do is to get kids keeping up with physics at A-level, which is the, uh, the real determination as to whether people can obviously go on there. So, <coughs> let me just close with my three sort of headlines. Uh, we can't and we don't underestimate the scale of engineering challenge, new technologies, and building things in the UK. But it is the time to get on with building things and to focus on delivery. It is not the time to continue this dialogue about what's the right answer, what's the right policy. We just drown ourselves in the UK in the intellectual debate about whether that's the right answer. We have to get the industry and government and stakeholder groups working together in a new way to get what I call a compelling narrative that my mother can understand about why we need to pay for the infrastructure and why we need society to accept its location around the UK. We've got to stop fiddling with the planning system and just leave what we have in place and ensure it works. Uh, and lots of the businesses in this room, I would implore you to get into schools uh, and talk about the opportunities and talk about science and engineering uh, and not do it when someone reaches the age of 18 because it's too late. The evidence is crystal clear that actually it's in primary schools that we need to inspire our kids. And the UK is just so far behind some of our friends in the continent and so far behind the Far East as well. Uh, and that's something that we should all worry about. Thank you very much. Steve, thanks very much.